material, and that's one of the key technologies for the next wave of the clean energy revolution. In Indonesia, after a 250 kilometer round trip, a drone has just delivered backpacks and books to school children in a remote village, opening up corridors in the skies for educators to get the next generation the tools they really need. Now in the city of Sin, Las Vegas, Nevada, clean food pioneers have created a culinary marvel, the Impossible Burger. It's the first commercially available bioengineered all plant-based patty, which is indistinguishable from real beef. Cows everywhere are utterly over the moon. <laughs> Now, Russian and Japanese scientists have extracted ancient cells from a baby woolly mammoth called Yuka. They injected it into a mouse, stimulating biological activity of cells that have been dormant for 28,000 years. A Chinese doctor has completed the first 5G telerobotic brain surgery in Hunan, on 3,000 miles away on an Alzheimer's patient in Beijing. The doctor said the latency was so low, it felt like doing surgery in real time. And in Germany, scientists are cutting and pasting the code of life using genetic editing, our ability to manipulate DNA. And they wound back the clock on human blood cells to their most primitive and potent state, stem cells, which can then be coaxed into skin, help regrow muscle for a heart replacement, and even regenerate damaged neurons. And Tane, we should also probably point out uh, that every single one of those stories we just told you about there has happened since the beginning of this year. So, the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And a generation ago, all of those stories would have sounded like magic. No one even bothered to predict them because no one could have imagined them. And the reason they are possible today is because of science which allows us to take what's in our imagination and bring it to fruition. It's the human ability to make the seemingly magical real. And because of the way we share knowledge today, we stand on the shoulders of more and more giants, allowing us to reach ever greater heights. And that's the real reason the world is changing so quickly. But science isn't just about space travel or plant-based vegan hippie burgers or medical advancements. As the wise Carl Sagan once said, science isn't just a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. It's the best method that we all have, that humanity has to make sense of the world around us. And unlike ideology, science allows for correction. So it constantly evolves. And given just a single piece of contrary evidence, it insists we throw out everything that we once knew. Now, as scientists, when we get it wrong, we actually get excited, because it means We've learned something. And that's why science is fucking amazing. It changes, those changes rapidly accrue, altering our world irrevocably. Okay, so why are two random hipsters from Melbourne uh, in, you know, with bad fashion and in the inability to groom themselves, uh, standing here on stage talking to you about science at a technology conference, by sounding like bad versions of Dr. Carl? Well, science is the bedrock, it's the foundation of the disruptive technologies that are changing the business environment today. So if you don't understand the science, then it's hard to understand the changes that we're seeing around us. So what Tane and I are going to do today for you over the next, say, 50 minutes, is we're going to take you on a tour across the frontiers of scientific and technological disruption in an effort to kind of show you the realm, really, of what's possible in 2009. Does that sound good for everyone? Everyone up for that? Yeah. Cool. Okay, great. Uh, but to do this, um, I'm going to have to ask you to just all take a deep breath with me. And we're going to have to go back into history, all the way back into the dusty, distant, forgotten footnotes of history. You may not remember this time, but we're going to go back to the year 1995. <laughs> the sound of the time machine. <laughs> Don't worry, it gets worse. Does anyone else remember that beautiful sound? 
<laughs> it was the, the modem died. <laughs> Did it die six of the modem? Yeah. Wow. So it was beautiful for me because in 1995 was the first time I heard that sound. I was living in rural New Mexico, and I was some kind of weird jock nerd hybrid. And so I played basketball for the First Baptist Church Warriors. Under, so under 12? What's that? Yeah. The, 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 the first team or the... No, the First Baptist Church Warriors. Uh, was it the top team for the team? No, 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 we were terrible. Yeah. But I had plenty of people to talk to about b-ball and basketball, but I didn't have anyone to discuss the Lord of the Rings and to nerd out about whether Tom Bombadil was a crucial part of the Fellowship of the Rings, embodying the spirit guide of Middle-earth, or was it one of Tolkien's biggest mistakes? But then the internet came and I had chat rooms, and I could furiously nerd out to many people all over the planet about the Lord of the Rings. 1995 was also a pretty big year for me. I turned 12 years old. Nice braces, man. Thanks, Tony. And can you zoom in on that necklace? <laughs> That is a marijuana necklace. That is, that is a marijuana necklace. Not only is that a marijuana necklace, that is a glow-in-the-dark marijuana necklace. <laughs> you certainly were a catch. Thank you. Well, now, as you can see, very popular with the ladies, Tane and I, uh, in 1995. But it was a big year because not only did I get my first internet connection, I also got my first girlfriend. What was her name? Her name, Tane, was Sweet Cheeks 13. Better on the internet because that was the only place that girls spoke to me. Now, I thought I'd done really, really well because there were 16 million people online in 1995. So, finding Sweet Cheeks 13 for me felt like finding a beautiful needle in a digital haystack. If you fast forward to today, 2019, there are now five and a half billion people on the planet over the age of 14, five and a half billion adults. How many of them have phones? Five billion. And over 4 billion have smartphones. This is the most extraordinary technological uptake in human history. Never before have so many of us adopted a tool, a smartphone, so quickly and at such scale. We're at the point now where about three quarters of adults on Earth have access to a smartphone. More than six applications now have over a billion users. We've got 2.8 million gamers on the planet. There are 250 million people playing Fortnite every single day. This is, we're getting to the point really where almost every person on the planet has access to the greatest information resource our species has ever known. Now as we all furiously connect and stream and tweet, play games and download, we're creating trillions of terabytes of data. Not only do data flows allow for the better movement of goods, services, finance, and people, they have value in their own right. In fact, since 2015, data, zeros and ones, has accounted for more global GDP growth than the world's entire physical goods trade. Data is the new oil. That is not some Silicon Valley soundbite. It is an economic reality. And unlike oil, an expensive, centralized, portable resource, data is a lot cheaper and a lot more accessible. And it's really providing the opportunity for hundreds of countries to millions of small businesses and organizations and to billions of our fellow human beings that have never been able to participate in the global economy before. Now remember, in the same way that the industrial giants of the last generation invested heavily in infrastructure to move around their valuable resources, today's industrial giants, tech giants, are investing in infrastructure as well. We've got servers, we've got towers, and most importantly, most people think that all the data is in the cloud, but that's just a marketing term. We're talking about massive pipes that span hundreds of thousands of kilometers that are being installed in the deepest parts of our ocean as we build out this new infrastructure for the 21st century. All right, so why is data so disruptive? Well, to do that, we have to introduce you to the most powerful and dangerous people on the planet. No, it's, uh, it's not these guys. The oil barons, fortunately, they've had their time in the sun. No, it's not the investment bankers of the 1990s and early 2000s. These wolves of Wall Street took too many quaaludes, deceived millions of people, and eventually drove the global economy to its knees earlier this century. I mean, we just got out, saw what happened in the Royal Commission recently, Many of these people are still getting away with it. 
You are the most dangerous and the most powerful people on the planet in the year 2019. Anyone? You probably all already guessed it because it's all of you sitting in this room. It's the geeks. You see, the geeks are operating on different assumptions to the rest of the planet because the geeks are working with code. And the thing about code is that it's kind of like the oil refinery. It's, allowed, it's what allows us to take all that data and refine it, distribute it, and ultimately give it value. And code, in the language of economics, which is my profession, has a very different set of qualities to the way we traditionally think about goods, services, and products. Code has what we call the triple zero set of properties. So what does the economist mean by this? Well, the first is zero marginal cost of production. So once I've built a piece of code, it costs me nothing to create another unit. I can copy and paste it as many times as I want. How cool is that? It costs me the same whether I make one or one million. The second zero is what we call zero friction of distribution. So on a planet where everybody's connected, code goes anywhere at light speed. It costs me the same to send a piece of code from here to Parramatta as it does to send it to Buenos Aires or Beijing. Don't have to worry about supply chains, don't have to worry about trade wars or tariffs or supply chain management. All I've got to do is hit a button marked send. And the final triple zero is zero latency of updating. So once a new and improved version of the code comes along, I instantly get access to it. The software updates automatically. Many of our phones in this room are updating as we speak. Think about it like a metaphor of a car. If, you know, 20 years ago, my crappy, you know, Volkswagen van, if I still had it today with enough improvements and updates, today I would end up with something like a Ferrari. Or if I was really cool, a Tesla. This triple zero business model is at the heart of today's big tech giants. It's why if you look a decade ago, you can see that there's only one tech company in the top 10 most valuable companies in the world. The rest of it really is made up by the previous ones, the oil and gas giants. Uh, we've got a couple of telecoms companies in there. If you now look as of January 2019, in the top 10 most valuable companies in the world, seven of them are tech companies. Tech companies that run by producing and distributing code. That's the power of this business model. It's why it's changed the world so dramatically in such a short space of time. Yeah, code's like, more like an idea, right? Because once I share an idea with you, we both have a copy of it. And so that's why at society, we're going through a fundamental digital transformation. We're mapping the physical world around us into zeros and ones. Everything from mapping the code of life DNA, which is what I do in cancer research, to the physicists mapping massive gra gravitational patterns across the universe. But because we can store it as zeros and ones, these bits and bytes, we can accrue it, store it, large amounts of it, and most importantly, analyze and share the incredible value of this blossoming treasure trove. And that's why technology used to be, you know, a back office function, the Xerox machine, then IT was a sector on its own, but now technology itself is a layer over absolutely everything. So what happens when technology is a layer of everything? What happens when software eats the world? We've, we've all heard that term quite a lot. Well, what's really interesting is that the digital revolution then starts arriving in places we didn't think before. When you've got that layer over every aspect of our economy, the most important thing that it does is it gives our existing hardware and infrastructure new kinds of value. It allows us to do more with less. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take an example. Uh, what is the most amazing thing that human beings do? What is the most extraordinary human endeavor? I think for Tane and us, it's space. You went to space camp, actually, I think. I did, yeah, I've been a nerd for a long time. Uh, now, I hope most of you saw this last year. It was the launch of the Falcon Heavy, the prototype for the rocket that's one day gonna take us to Mars, making us an interplanetary species, hopefully within our lifetimes. She's been times or more She could spend till the eyes of fools As they ask her to fold the song to sing And there's fighting in the dance hall Oh man, look at those big men go It's a freaking show So rocket launches like these traditionally cost a few hundred million dollars. Yet the fuel to get us up there is only a little over 100,000. So why is it so expensive to get us into the stratosphere? 
Well, the hardware generally goes one way. We often throw away the rockets and the rocket boosters. I mean, imagine if the airline industry worked in that way. Yet the space industry has worked like that since its inception. Well, until very recently. So, not only are we launching ruby red electric sports cars, playing 1970s David Bowie's hits uh, on its way to Mars, we're also relanding the rockets. Now, no human being could have relanded these rockets. Well, maybe Han Solo, but you know, that's science fiction. It was done by a machine running on code. Now, there's only been small changes in the hardware. The material science has changed marginally in the aerospace industry in the last decade or so. What has changed is the software. And that is why code is so powerful. And one of the most exciting things is that code itself is now evolving. Because we are also now in the midst of machine learning revolution. We're now teaching our machines to learn dynamically from their environments. We're teaching them to read. We're teaching them to listen. We're teaching them to hear. We're teaching them to speak. We're teaching our machines to see. And most importantly, we're now teaching our machines to analyze and to predict in ways that we once thought were completely impossible. Now, in popular culture and amongst the general public, this kind of stuff is called artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence is kind of a meaningless term. It's like a Rorschach test for however you actually feel about technology. And if you're looking for a clue about the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence, Here's Matt Beloso, the, one of the chief technical advisors to the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Yeah, I mean, you should be very suspicious of two brightly blazered hipsters standing to you. part of my presentation. Yeah, talking to you about AI. So we're going to be talking to you about AI. <laughs> well, so I actually write machine learning. A lot of it is in Python. And what I do is create intelligent algorithms to scan the code of, D, uh, of cancer patients, DNA. We figure out the genetic changes that are causing a particular cancer. And then we monitor patients through time during their tre treatment. And we make sure that um, the bad strains aren't coming up. It's not evolving into resistance. And if it does, hopefully we can change therapeutic track and uh, improve patient outcomes. So this cognitive code, AI, let's call it machine learning, um, has given us an incredible new tool in our fight against this devastating disease. Now, there's an app called Skin Vision, which is an image recognition app, which is much better at the world's leading dermatologists at diagnosing skin cancer. So your average GP gets it right at melanoma about 60% of the time, dermatologists about 72, and then the world's melanoma specialist in the, in the low 90s. So this is 97% accurate. Now it gives you multiple levels of risk, low, medium, or high. And if it goes to high, then it goes to a team of five experts, dermatological experts. And so in a country like Australia and New Zealand that have the highest skin cancer rates in the world, this is an incredibly powerful tool because early detection is your best chance at survival. Now we're using similar image recognition algorithms to look at brain scans of six-month-olds to determine whether the kid is likely to have autism. Human clinicians, by contrast, have to wait till the kid turns two. We're using similar algorithms to diagnose Alzheimer's up to nine years before doctors can, and even spot invisible tumors in x-rays. But this stuff goes far beyond the bricks and mortars of our medical research institutes and our hospitals. For example, one of my favorites comes from Nigeria. It's called Ubenwa. And it listens to the modulation and frequency of an infant's cries to diagnose birth asphyxia, the third leading cause of infant mortality around the world, killing 1.2 million kids each year. The only way to stop it, immediate and early intervention. So a nurse in a maternity ward, someone in a remote village, equipped with this free app and a smartphone could save millions of lives. 
So when that kid gets a little older, anyone have young kids? Do you like to read them bedtime stories? Imagine if you could add a little bit more magic, a machine learning algorithm that could follow along when you read and augment it, spice it up with a bit of lighting and audio effects. Check out what novel effects it's done. Life. It was a cold, dark night as the campers retired. The moon glowed. A wolf howled. There was crackling from the fire. The bushes rustled, making a sound. Thump. 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 They hear footsteps on the ground. There was a flash of lightning. A crack of thunder. A shadowy figure was approaching their side. <laughs> So we have totally new ways of traumatizing our children. Which <laughs> <laughs> is great news for everyone. <laughs> okay, that's cute, but how does this stuff actually get used to make a big difference? Well, remember how we said that the geeks rule the world? What would happen if the geeks decided to apply machine learning and they started to, started to write code for agriculture, the largest profession on the planet, and probably still the most important well, that's what this would look like. The whole idea of climate is that we can use modern technologies to help farmers everywhere in the world. We use machine learning, artificial intelligence, and big data to derive insights. But this might sound a bit abstract to you, so let me give you an example. Let's say you see a sick crop in your field. You can just like easily take an image with Plantex. This image is sent to our servers, analyzed by deep neural networks, and we will tell you on the spot and instantly what is wrong with your plant. So, if you're one of the almost one billion small-scale farmers on the planet with access to a phone, you are now as good as the world's leading agronomists at recognizing crop diseases and figuring out what to do about it. At Google, they've used machine learning and they've applied it to the management of energy in their data centers, and that improved cooling efficiency by 40% and reduced overall costs by 15%. That company has more data servers than anyone else on the planet. And it's a single piece of cognitive code that's saving that company tens of millions of dollars every single year. What other innovation gives you those kinds of productivity leaps and cost savings? And the same company is now applying machine learning to look at historical data around weather patterns for its wind turbines in the different areas where they're situated, and then it's able to make better predictions, which improves the efficiency of those turbines by 20%. Once again, a software innovation that changes the value of the hardware. At General Electric, they're using machine learning to now analyze computational flow dynamics used in the preparation of better and more efficient industrial engines, and they say that that's reduced the development time by about 50%. That is an extraordinary productivity achievement. We're using machine learning algorithms that can recognize images to look at what's going on on a production line. The production line has been around for more than a century, but now because the machine can spot what the human being is doing, it can spot the places where efficiency gains are possible. So Andrew Ng, the former chief scientist of Badu, says, if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, then we can probably automate it using AI, machine learning, learning either now or in the near future. And of course, this has huge implications for business. JP Morgan has trained a machine learning algorithm to scan through commercial loan agreements to look for errors, mainly grammatical. It's not a very sexy example. However, it's already saved them 360,000 hours of legal billing time. Now, the jury is still out whether it's better for people to spend less time with lawyers, or whether it's better for lawyers to spend less time with people like me. Now, the smart lawyers are all over it, right? So Slaughter & May, one of the oldest and most prestigious law firms in the world, recently acquired a machine learning startup from Silicon Valley Roundabout in London. Now, the lead on the project, Sally Woke, said, it cuts out the work that people find the least interesting. It does not cut out analyzing the results and looking at the importance of transactions and relevant details which the client cares about. There's a tiny little clue in there about how machine learning is actually applied in the workforce and in an organization. And that clue can also be spotted from Goldman Sachs. Goldman 
used the machinery algorithm to automate 50% of the steps required before conducting a big IPO. That used to be something of a bit of a dark art at Goldman. You know, new analysts would come along and there'd be a checklist and you'd sort of learn as you went along with the job. The machine now does 50% of that process. But Goldman didn't fire 50% of their analysts. Instead, those analysts now spend more time picking up the phone and speaking to clients or collaborating with their colleagues to develop better strategies. You know, the important stuff, the stuff that human beings do really well. Yeah, it's not the machines versus the humans, it's the machines and the humans. It's not about replacing us, it's about augmenting our skills. I mean, you know, we've already shown you that an algorithm is better than a human being at diagnosing medical imaging. So does that mean radiologists are all going to be out of a job? Well, I like what Professor Curtis Langwaltz has to say, one of the best radiologists in the world from Stanford University. Artificial intelligence will not replace radiologists. Those radiologists who use artificial intelligence will replace the ones who don't. And just replace radiologists, or whatever industry or job title you care to use. So, I mean, what, that's all big business and medical professionals. But there are thousands of free online courses from some of the world's best institutes that you have access to, that more than half of humanity does. All you need is an internet connection and a bit of good old-fashioned curiosity. For example, take my dad. He's almost 70 years old in October. We're throwing a good party for him. So he's an old dog, and he's just learned some new tricks. So he's in finance. And he took some online courses, so let's see. He likes free things, so let's see what he has to say. I'm Carlin's dad. I've just taken several <coughs> machine learning AI courses. One from Stanford, two from Fast AI. I highly recommend them. Fast AI courses take you right up to the absolute state of the art. Now, that's Tane's dad. He's a geek. Tane is obviously a geek. What about organizations that maybe aren't ready for this kind of innovation? What about an organization, for example, like the Australian Federal Police? Tane and I have been working with them for the last three years. Uh, they employed us to help them implement disruptive techno technological solutions in their workplace. And that is the most hierarchical and impossible organization we've ever done business with. I mean, they are so conservative, so unwilling to change, and the hierarchies are so difficult to break through. You think you're having problems in your company, you should try working with the police. But when we spoke to them about machine learning and artificial intelligence, we ran our pilot project with them, and this is what they were able to pull off, using pretty off-the-shelf software. They applied it in a pilot study to two of their existing cases. The first was a foreign bribery case, where they had to comb through 900,000 files to find the correct evidence. And in the second case, it was a financial fraud case, they had to comb through two million files. So they had four detectives working around the clock for almost four years to be able to actually figure out what the problem, what to get the evidence for that case. These are highly trained superintendents and detectives who are combing through files. It's unnecessary work. When they applied machine learning to the same case, the computer was able to find the same evidence in 65 days and 40 days, respectively. So a total saving there of 622 days and almost four years of man hours in the second case. Sure enough, when they took that to the bosses and said, here we go, the bosses said, great, buy it all. We're, we're going to roll that out. And so now the AFP in the Financial Crimes Unit is running out machine learning all the way across their evidence base. And Brett James, the superintendent in charge of that project, had recently called me and said that they've just gotten their first successful new prosecution as a result of employing those algorithms. In fact, here's Brett. Don't be scared to take on AI. See it as a challenge, but also, also take your people on the journey with you. Uh, one of the things I, I probably didn't consider at the start, which I looked look back on and, and it was one of the greatest realizations for me was that uh, people are scared people are actually scared of this technology particularly people that aren't well informed in it and they don't want to adopt it uh, it's very difficult to get them to adopt it quickly actually talking to our talking to our investigators and letting them know that we're not trying to replace them what we're trying to do is enhance their decision making was was a key factor so that's AI in a pretty understandable setting. But we've also heard about the downsides of this technology too. We've heard, for example, about machine learning being used to create human avatars. This is from Facebook's labs. 
And they're using machine learning to now create very lifelike human avatars where we can recreate human expressions. And once we've got the digital file, we're able to now take any expression. You can see all the people in this video over here are performing the same expression, but the machine is now doing that for them. And that's like crazy dystopian stuff, right? We've all seen Black Mirror. I mean, we know where this one ends. Right? We all end up in a panopticon um, locked into rooms um, of mind-bending horror and destruction. But that's the stories we like to tell ourselves on television and entertainment. We don't tell ourselves the stories about how those enhanced um, technologies with better fidelity are able to help, for example, kids with autism to learn facial expressions so that they can better navigate social situations. Or about the people who are in pain in hospitals who can use those virtual environments to reduce their suffering, or people who are training to become more empathetic carers for the most vulnerable people in our society, for people, for example, with dementia. I mean, the police, they're getting hold of facial recognition glasses, right? This is something out of the worst nightmares of Orwell and Huxley. Yet, did you hear about what happened in Delhi last year when the police force got a hold of facial recognition software? The first thing they did was go to all the orphanages and take photos of the kids, then match that to a database of all the pictures of the city's missing children. In four days, track down 3,000 of them reuniting many of them with their families for the first time in years. It's not the technology itself. Technology is not good, nor is it bad, nor is it neutral. It's what we do with it that matters, and that's why we have to really set our intentions right. Well, I think, Tane, for the, the two of us, the most profound application of machine learning is language translation. This is one of the first prototypes of an instant in-ear translation device that allows us to speak in real time to anyone on the planet in any language. For Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans, welcome to the real life version of the baby fish. So since the dawn of time, our inability to understand each other has been a key impediment to human progress. But in the lifetimes of everyone in this room, those barriers are going to disappear. And that's why the code is such a powerful tool for human progress. So, Let's change tack here a little bit. We've been talking a lot about software. What we're going to do now is we want to change things up and talk a little more about hardware. Yeah, what happens when the software meets our big mechanical machinery? Well, we get the arrival of the robots. Now, robots are familiar to us. Uh, the robots are an essential part of the modern economy. The escalators that you travel up here into the theater on, that's a robot. Your washing machine at home, that's a robot. Um, and we're used to industrial robots that need to be kept separately in rooms so that they can manufacture cars. And in Japan, one of the most automated societies on Earth, they actually say they have a principle for where robots are useful. They say that robots are useful for tasks that have one of the three or more of the Ks. The tasks that are dirty, dangerous, and difficult. What do we mean by that? All right, so these are roughnecks. They're employees who move around big machinery and pipes on offshore oil rigs. Now they get paid around $120,000 each because it's a dirty and difficult, dangerous job. And it requires 14 of them on the clock at any one time. Now this is the iron roughneck. It costs a few million dollars, yet it's reduced the number of workers from 14 to three, easily paying for itself and then some. We've got robot welders now that can carry out the same tasks as a human being on container ships that move around physical goods on our planet. And you can see the robot there is almost three times more efficient and quicker than the human at doing the same job. And we've got bricklaying robots now. This is the Hadrian X, built by a company out of Perth, and it can lay about a thousand bricks in an hour. By comparison, it takes two master bricklayers a day to do that job. Uh, and the robot also works 24 hours a day, it doesn't take city breaks, uh, and it doesn't join the union either. <laughs> All right, so, you know, for the past few decades, that's how we've traditionally thought of automation and robotics. But things are heating up, they're getting really interesting. Thanks to the smartphone wars of the past decade, camera sensors and chips, electronics are now super cheap, and advancements in material science and new materials and our machine learning algorithms are allowing robots to do increasingly complex tasks. So we're seeing an evolution from the mechanical to the digital to the cognitive. 
We are in the midst of a, co a Cambrian explosion in robotics, and they are taking us to some of the most inhospitable places on the planet, traversing our icy depths, taking us to the deepest parts of our oceans, taking us to the tops of volcanoes, where magma spews out, to map the volcanic calderas, to give us new insight into the inner workings of our planet. In the deserts of North Africa and the forests of Central Mexico, we're using new laser scanning techniques to uncover lost ancient civilizations. And we're using those robots to carry out inspections on wind turbines. We're automating agriculture. We're using new robot tractors and automatic harvesters. We're creating tiny little intelligent robots that can spot a ripe tomato on the vine and gently pluck it without damage. Looks better than your garden. We've got in the outskirts of our cities, in the old abandoned manufacturing zones, vertical farms where the robots move around the trays and they're able to plant new uh, plants, they're able to monitor growth. We've got robots in our warehouses redefining the production lines that move around crates, um, robots that perform the back breaking and boring and mind-numbingly repetitive tasks of the 20th century. And we can strap those robots onto us. They can augment our capabilities. We've got robots that can give us added strength or reduce injury and fatigue, allowing us to do more with less. And those robots can even go inside us. Robot surgeons that are able to get better precision and access the places where humans can't. And thanks to better dexterity of our robots, they can now pick up an object and throw it in a box. And I mean, the robot never misses, unlike us. And thanks to better sensors and that dexterity, they're much safer to be with, preventing human harm. So they're entering the workplace, working side by side with us, cooperatively. They're learning to emulate our movements, work in better ways and intuitively with us. And I mean, these are powerful machines, allowing us to lift heavy objects and giving us superhuman strength. And this cooperative workforce that we're building with robots, perhaps I think we should recoin the term from robot to cobot. Those robots look like us. We can emulate human expressions. We can fake human emotion on the faces of those robots. We've got robots that move like us, that jog like us. You can go for a jog in the park like a robot these days. That robot can jump like us. Although I'm willing to bet that most of you can't do this. Now, our robots are even beginning to outperform our beloved pets. Um, we don't like that trashy music. How about a bit of real music? Any fans of metal in the audience? Any metalheads? Metal. Uh, oh, yeah. Any fan of Compressorhead? Or, I'm sorry, of, of uh, Motorhead? Uh, famous band? Well, we'd like to introduce you to our new favorite band, Compressorhead. <laughs> Definitely. 
upon us. Judgment Day. They lived only to face a new nightmare. The war against the machines. Alright, that's a bit excessive. You know, that's Hollywood. But the media is not that far behind. I mean, we're gonna have massive job loss and devastation with grocery stores with no checkout lines or checkout clerks. We've got robots scanning the aisles, doing all the stock shake automatically. We've got Flippy, the hamburger flipping robot. Now, in high school, I sweated over the greasy grill to make like minimum wage. And I'm just so sorry that future generations will never have that <laughs> chance and that amazing experience. But I mean, of course, you know, we're going into a wage and employment death spiral warns the International Monetary Fund. I mean, that's the IMF. So are we all going to be superfluous sacks of meat in this world of metal and machines? Well, you probably guessed it. The answer is no. Because the thing about robots is that they, they don't replace jobs. Robots replace tasks within jobs. And that's the thing that the media never gets right when they're talking about this issue. Specifically, they replace the tasks within jobs that are historical, predictable, and where the cost per error is low. And that's what we actually call our future country robot rule of thumb. These, this is the way to figure out which tasks are automatable, especially within your workplace, and which jobs are maybe not as susceptible to automation. So what, what, what do we mean by that? All right, let's take the task of floor cleaning. Well, is it historical? Yeah, since we've had homes and abodes, we've needed to keep them clean. Is it predictable? Yeah, it's generally within a confined space. Four walls, you know, needs to be done regularly. And is it, what's the cost of the error? Pretty low. Maybe a bit of dirt on the floor, it knocks over the trash can, or scares the cat. So a highly automatable task. Let's try something that's a little bit uh, less complicated than uh, a floor manager. What about an IT manager? Is it a task that is historical? Not very historical. It's probably only a job that's been around for a few decades. Is it a job that's predictable? Well, I don't know. You, you could probably tell me. Um, as managers or as IT professionals, is it a predictable job? The answer is probably not very predictable at all. Although there may be certain tasks within that job that are predictable. Cost per error? Generally pretty low, except for when it's not. In which case, you're talking about the future of companies sometimes. So, is the job of an IT manager one that's highly automatable? The answer is that there are a few tasks that may be, but the answer is that the job itself cannot be automated. All right, so how about the task of driving a car? Well, is it historical? Yeah, since we've had cars, they've become a ubiquitous, increasingly ubiquitous part of our lives. Is it predictable? I would argue 100% yes. The data is super clear. There are 60 permits of car companies doing autonomous driving in California alone. They've done over 70 uh, million kilometers on our roads, and the data is clear. They're way safer behind the wheel than these superfluous bags of meat, especially ones that are texting while driving. But what's the cost per error? It's incredibly high. Human injury or potential loss of life. And that's why, while the technology is actually here, it involves politics, law, and regulation, so it's a bit more of a complex thing. When the cost of error goes up, we need to think about very carefully how we implement it within our society and culture. Um, let's think about another example of that. What about the 737 MAX? Historical, yes, we've had planes for over a century. Predictable, yes, only six minutes of an average Boeing or Airbus flight is actually flown by a human being. Cost per error? Hundreds of lives. And in the case of the 737 MAX, that was a technological error that was then compounded by the lack of human training. So it's a combination of those two, where the error itself can be catastrophic, which is why it's in all the headlines. And I think for you, it's more of an ethical issue, actually. For me, it's ethical, because the, the technology that would have saved them was actually an option that you could have additionally purchased. It was an additional safety option. And so a lot of poorer airlines, the rich ones bought them, but in developing countries they didn't, hence Indonesia and Ethiopia. 
Yet now, regulation is forcing them to roll it out across all of them. So we need to, we need to change the mantra from move fast and break things with certain technologies, especially when the cost of error is high, to slow down and make sure things are okay. So that's the first reason that the robots are going to come and steal all our jobs and a way to think about it. Here's the second reason. We live in a capitalist society. Joseph Schubert, the great 20th century economist, said that capitalism is the act of creative destruction. So the robots take jobs away, but they also give us new jobs. Let me give you an example. In 1979, I was not born, but apparently there are a number of CEOs who say that they can date their career to before the invention of the electronic spreadsheet and after the invention. It was invented by a computer programmer named Dan Bricklin. And once they put one of the key tasks of being an accountant into digital format, it eliminated 400,000 jobs over the next 30 years in the United States. Bookkeepers, accountants, clerks, they all lost their jobs because that's what being an accountant used to be. You would fill out four long columns and you would have to match everything up and that was a real pain. Um, former accountants I can see in the audience are all nodding their heads because if you make one mistake, you have to go all the way back. But the United States created 600,000 new accounting jobs because accounting became cheaper, more efficient, more people demanded it, and so the accounting profession actually got a net increase. And we're seeing the same thing happen today. This is a machine learning algorithm. You can now take a picture on Excel of any um, table in the document, and the machine learning algorithm automatically generates an Excel spreadsheet. That's the latest update on Excel. Or the newest version of Excel also has a machine learning algorithm that allows you to do automatic analysis. So you've got a standard table over there, you just click on Analyze, and this is what algorithms do best, is they're able to spot patterns that human beings can't. So it generates a few tables there, that doesn't look very impressive, but then the machine is also able to say, well, hold on, what other insights can we derive? And it's saying over there, for example, that spending is decreasing over time for your marketing, uh, for your marketing team. So that's, these things are, the innovation happens all the time, it's constantly being changed. Let's give you another example, what about flying planes? When the Wright brothers invented human flight more than a century ago, they could never have imagined that the invention of one single technology would lead to a world today where more than four billion people take flights, where more than four billion flights are taken around the planet. We have entire infrastructures, airports, air stewards, um, pilots that are dedicated um, to serving people um, around the, the invention of this technology. And that continues again to change today. So I said that most of plane flying is now automated and is done by a machine, and yet the demand for airline pilots has gone up globally, because as the machine took over more of the task, flying became safer, it became cheaper, and so therefore more people demanded more flying, and so now there's actually a shortage of airline pilots around the world. This has created destruction in action. And of course, it's creating heaps of new jobs. Ten years ago, none of these jobs existed, including mine, bioinformatician a machine learning Python coding biology nerd who could read the code of life didn't exist a decade ago. So it's that creative destruction. Some jobs are becoming a bit more redundant and it's changing the nature of the economy, the types of jobs, and we're moving far more into the services and the human side. I mean, in Australia, we now have more registered fitness instructors than engineers because we've moved into a services-based economy. In the United States, the place of my birth, the hippies are totally taking over. Cannabis worker in 2018, the number one fastest growing job. And now they outweigh dental hygienists. And what was really interesting here is that that was a regulatory change that created those new kinds of job categories. And other kinds of regulatory change matter too. In South Africa, my home country, there are now more wind farm technicians than bus drivers because the country's building out a new energy infrastructure. And here in Australia, we're hopefully going to see the same thing happen as we create thousands of new jobs to install wind and solar for the 21st century. I would really like to leave you with this one final thought. Counterintuitively, in a world where technology is a layer of everything, it's actually the human skills that matter the most. And the future of work and the next economy is selecting for those things. Things like empathy, compassion, our ability to communicate, and they're all like rocket fuel for working together. And don't take it from me, all the big tech companies, they're onto it. There's Google Oxygen, which says of the top seven, or the top eight skills, technical aptitude is at the bottom. The rest are things like leadership, vision, communication, 
having compassion for your human being, a fellow of peers, and also like having value in their opinion, even though you disagree with them. So in the future of work and the next economy, collaboration trumps genius. And just remember, technology is human. Because our ancestors were apes that got lost between the forest and the river. And they accidentally invented nuclear weapons and antibiotics and the wheel. Uh, technology has always been an intimate part of the story of human evolution. It's a tool that we use to overcome our challenges. It's a tool that we use to adapt to change. And that's why you need to include both the human and the technological as we move forward into the 21st century. And combine science and technology with the human ingenuity, the soft and the hard. They give us the tools to make a better future. And that, that common belief in a better future is one of the strongest glues there is. It gives us the opportunity to respect to love one another, and to work together in collaboration. And that is a powerful force, not only in business, but in life. So thank you very much for having us and staying with us all the way through this journey. And we hope you have a fantastic day um, and a fantastic conference. Enjoy. Thank you.